Thanks for coming out. Because today we're going to talk about DevSecOps. Who likes the word DevSecOps? Nobody. Of course not. I mean, it's like, it's, like my, it's, like, it's like my granddad who wants to talk slang to his grandchildren, right? Want to be the cool kid. We have this cool abbreviation, developer operations, then we put security in between because it's so important. I hate the word. I hate the word DevSecOps. Although the meaning of DevSecOps is important. I mean, security is everywhere. Not to just jump on the hype train, but security is important. And I'm going to show you why. But first, who am I? For the people who don't know me, the most of you, I guess. My name is Brian. I'm living here. I'm based here in the Netherlands, in Breda, so the lower part of the Netherlands. So maybe people will say I'm more Belgium than, Holland, than, than Dutch. I'm working as a developer advocate for Sneak. Been a, I've been a Java engineer for over a decade. Uh, I'm involved with Utrecht Jug. I'm a co-lead to the Secure Developer Community, which is an online community about secure development, of course. Uh, well, Oracle Groundbreaker, bloody blah, blah, blah. If you want to reach me, my Twitter handle is over there. Feel free to ask questions or to email me if you're more old school. All right. Well, DevSecOps. First of all, we want to, we want to solve a problem, right? So what are these problems? I mean, if you see a decade ago or something, we wanted to release software every month, maybe every quarter, maybe in some branches even every year. But nowadays, we want to speed up these things. I mean, nowadays, I deploy two times a day. But still, security is on my ass. I mean, it's like they want to audit my stuff, and that takes three weeks, but I want to deploy two times a day, so we have a collision over there, right? And the other point is, I mean, as a developer, I want to develop. I want to create things, new cool stuff, and I want to put it in production as fast as possible. My product manager wants the same because we want to beat the competition, right? But to be honest, I do not focus security that much. I focus on the fact that I need to provide new business value. So my clicker is currently, yeah. The other problem is we have still siloed security expertise. I mean, security comes at the end of the line. If you want to go to production, there is a security team that says, no. Who knows that? Who, ha who has that feeling? There's that the security team is like, no, you can't, because whatever. And that's not good. It's painful. And it gives me a lot of rework. I hate that. But the most important thing is, it is important, though, because at the end of the line, our customer data could be compromised if we don't. So we have a bit of an internal clash. So, OK, say we just dump that security team. Is that fair? I mean, how bad is that situation? I mean, who has heard of Equifax? Who has heard of Equifax two years ago? I would say that's great marketing. For those, who, for, you, for those of you who do, who, do, who do not know, Equifax is a credit reporting company in the US. And it used a outdated Apache Struts library. There was a vulnerability found disclosed and fixed, but they forgot to update, or they were way too late by updating. At the end, 143 million records were exposed to the public. You can say that's good marketing or not, but everybody knows of Equifax, right? And the funny thing is, with that problem, attackers were in for months until they just released that data. So without knowing, Somebody was already in that system and just digging around, like, what's there? What's here? Oh, that looks nice. Let's collect that and collect that. They took their time. Who of you is a developer? Most of you. All right. Say this is your application, right? Cool. This is the thing you ship to production. Then most of the time, this is your code. Why? We heavily depend on frameworks, libraries, Who's a JavaScript developer? An NPM, yeah. Or Maven, or Gradle, or whatever. We, ha we heavily depend on open source, most of the time open source, things to help us out. 
which is good because we want to focus on the business value, right? So why do all the plumbing stuff? We have a library for that. Cool. So say we have this serverless example, just a bunch of code. It has 19 lines of code, 19 lines of code, and it has two direct dependencies. That turns out to be, ooh, I go way too fast. Again, 19 lines of code, two dependencies, 19 dependencies in total. From that 20, 90, to 90 lines of code, the, the point you, the, the, the amount of lines you produce and you push to production is almost 200,000. You see what I'm getting to? Next one, I'm, I'm let, I'm let you, I'll let you do the, do the math. So say I have this spring serverless example. It's about 220 lines of code, very neat for a spring Java application, I would say. I'm a Java developer, I know, we're a bit verbose, I know, I'm sorry. It has five dependencies. How many indirect dependencies, or how many, how many total dependencies would that be? Just guess, yell. It's Java, it's not NPM. It's spring, it's not, it's, it's, not that, it's bad, but it's not that bad. It's 54, including the indirect. How many lines of code does this 222 line program, Neath program I made, pretty cool, ships to production? How many lines of code would that be? 1.2 million, who more, are there more? One, no, it's, it's, uh, it's about 500K, as somebody said already. So that means we heavily depend on open source. And open source usage has exploded the last couple of years. Not, not just the last couple of years, but it exploded even more. And I mean, as an attacker, get in the mind of that attacker. As a attacker, what would you do if you know that an open source package that is widely used has an exploit? I would target that. And I would blindly try to target everybody until Somebody has that vulnerable package because it's the easy way. If you look at that exploit from that Apache Struts exploit for, for Equifax, Equifax, well, Equifax wasn't targeted. Equifax was just in that area and somebody tried it and said, oh, hey, it works over here, fun. Let's dig into deep. So let's look at some statistics. I mean, over the last couple of years, the to total packages that are indexed per ecosystem massively exploded. Say from 2018 to 2019, NPM was the great winner. But if you see the steepness of the line, of the purple blue line that's Maven Central, it's also quite impressive. It's over 100,000 extra packages indexed this year, or between January 2018 and 2019. If we're gonna look at the vulnerabilities for each ecosystem, Maven Central, AKA Java, it's the great winner. So you know by a lot of ecosystems that are out there and a lot of packages that we can use, there are a lot of vulnerabilities there. And the point is it's not the vulnerability in the top level dependencies. Most of the time, for instance, for Maven and NPM, take those, those two because I think those two are the biggest ones. It's not the direct dependencies. Most of the problems are in the indirect dependencies. For Spring, for instance, the Jackson parser. It's one vulnerability within Spring Boot, for instance, that's still there. Well, I don't know if we are now at 214, maybe it's solved. I didn't check this morning. And if we ask these, these maintainers how confident they are in their own security knowledge, this, were, this was the result. 63% says, meh, kinda. But we do rely on these things, right? Heavily on Apache Commons or Apache Struts or whatever, which is the Apache Foundation. And if we ask people who is responsible, and of course multiple people are responsible, it's not only developers, most of the people say it's developers include and operations together, so it's more than 100%, yes I know because there are multiple answers possible, but at least 80%, over 80% said developers do have some responsibility. So, how do you find out about vulnerabilities? 27% don't. So, 
Once a vulnerability is discovered, and maintainers are very quick, how many days in general does it take to fix it? Guess. 60. It's the median. So there are people that, there are maintainers that do it in like 42 hours or 40 hours or 24 hours, but there are people that take much longer. It depends on the package, of course. But it's the median. So say a package is out. How many times does it take to get uh, a, a vulnerability disclosed? 50, 50 what? Years? Days. Days. 2.55 years. So that means that if a package is not vulnerable today, it can be vulnerable tomorrow or the day after. So looking at it from a developer point of view is one thing, but if, when it's in production, and say, for instance, banking systems or government systems do not always upgrade every week, every month, maybe twice a year, it can be that these things were not vulnerable at the point of deployment, but are vulnerable now. I will skip over this slide. Who uses Docker? Pretty much think Docker is new, right? Docker is cool, and we have the Docker certified images. Well, if we take the 10, top 10 most used images from Docker, and these are all, cert now, these are not all, all, uh, all certified Docker images, but from certified vendors like Node, um, MySQL, PHP, that kind of stuff. All of them have vulnerabilities. The node package, the standard node package, the latest one, has over 500 vulnerabilities, which were traced back to the base image. The base image using an old, older uh, Debian package, which, which have over 500 vulnerabilities in it. So by just blindly trusting these images, you might have a problem. And uh, when do you scan for your Docker images for OS, uh, for OS vulnerabilities? 50% says, we do not And how do we find out about vulnerabilities about deployed containers? 45% said, I don't know. So it's quite important. But that's enough statistics. Let's go and hack. Because that was the, that was the title of the, of the talk, right? So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you some common vulnerabilities in some applications we have. We, we created some applications, and they're vulnerable because I want to show them. For instance, we have this goofy to-do app. And I can say something like buy beer, which is the most important part after this talk, right? Just a simple to-do uh, to -do list. But it also has this most ever awesome about page, right? How, I mean, this is responsive. This is the most responsive you can get. But say, for instance, we're gonna, we gonna hack the IC, we, we're gonna exploit the ST library. And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna do a path reversal. So, who knows what a path reversal is? Cool, cool. So, say, for instance, what should I do if I want to do a path reversal? Any ideas? Dot, 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 okay. So dot dot slash something like this, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. Because the ST library is a real library. Wait, I want to be cool. I want to be a hacker. So say, for instance, it's uh, let's, let's, let's use curl. So HTTP, localhost, what was it? 3001 slash public slash about. Sorry, oh, Dutch HTML, thank you. For me, it's late as well. So that works. So again, let me use it over here because maybe my browser is interfering. Nah, doesn't work. It's, it's, the, it's the opening page with goof to do, as you can see here. So any, any suggestions? Encode with, encode with slashes? Oh, you mean escaping, like this? Oh, well, well let's, let's try this. So let's, 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 escape, uh, let's escape this. Nah, doesn't work. I heard somebody say encoding. So who knows the encoding of a dot? Who knows the encoding? Come on. Who knows the encoding of a dot? Sorry? Google. 
Well, it's percent to E. I do have my cheat sheet over here, but I was wondering if somebody says, well, percent to E, I would say you, sir, are a hacker. Luckily, you're not, not hackers over here, so I can be safely doing this, this thing, and we have a safe environment over here. So I said something like this, right? Let me check, and it does work. I have path reversal. That is cool, but say, for instance, what I do over here is I see that, for instance, what is wrong here, I can go to my package.json. That is important. I can go through my system, but I can also say package.json. And now I know all of the libraries you have and you use, so I can look for more vulnerabilities. I mean, this is a vulnerability that just reads. And you may say, well, how important is that? Well, that's just as important as writing, because if I can read your system, I can go into maybe some property file, get your, get, 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 get your uh, uh, database credentials out, but now I can go to your package.json and see what kind of more, more vulnerabilities you have, and just scan them, and you make it easy for me. But the ST library is a real library, so the simple dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash doesn't work. If you simply upgrade to a newer version, this is already fixed. Right? So you see how important it is to keep track of that dependency. So let's go to another one. Say we're going uh, to do a, um, regular, a regular expression kind of thing. Who likes regular expressions? Really? <laughs> who, likes reading, who likes reading somebody else's regular expressions? <laughs> wow, 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 you're, you're my biggest friend now. I, a regular expressions for me is a one-time thing. I like to write them and then dump it. They're write only, yeah, that's, mo most of the things are read only, but this is a write only thing, regular expressions. Right? Regular expressions are cool to write, and like, it's very neat, it's very, and then it's like, what the hell did this guy do, man? So, for instance, but how does a regular expression work? Say, for instance, we have something like this. Uh, I'm just, just putting up a regular expression, like, mm, like this. Say, this is my regular expression, not the dot, and it matches against this string. How do you know how it matches? I mean, does it use the, the, the plus? Does it use the star? Does it use the plus until half of the string and then the star? Does it use the star only? Does it do plus, star, plus? You don't know, right? It just matches. That's how regular expression works. But a regular expression works the way if it matches, it's, quick, it's pretty quick. But if it doesn't match, it, it, is, it is some kind of backtracking algorithm. It starts to backtrack until it might finish. And what is the one thing that is different between NPM or be between JavaScript and Java? What's the worst thing? There? Oh, there's a lot of things different if you ask a Java programmer. NPM is single-threaded. Or JavaScript is single-threaded. So if I can use this thing with a regular expression and overload my CPU by backtracking an algorithm with a regular expression that takes forever, it's stuck. Let me try that. It's fun. So, okay, for instance, let me just check. Let me just do that again so you can see it better. Say we do this algorithm, or algorithm, we, we say we, we call this method, right? And it works. I use HTTPI, which is a common line um, HTTP server. It worked. What does it give me back? Let me just, it says call mom in 20 minutes, which was exactly what the content of my string was. Okay, cool. But that's not a regular expression. So, let's say we do this. Let me just copy paste it, put it in here. And what we do, we want to buy milk in one to 60,000 fives minutes. So that's a whole lot of minutes. That's what we're trying to do. So it's five, 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 that's a lot of minutes. But it still works because it comes back, right? And if we look at it here, what's the, what, 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 what does it do? 
buy milk in infinity days. Well, that gives me a lot of time to buy milk. But I was talking about the backtracking stuff, right? How can we do that over here? Any ideas? In, sorry? Invalid number. Kind of. We just have to we just have to make sure it never matches, right? So if I do something like it does match to minutes, because that minute thing was eventually called today. Say I do, I'm I'm pretty lead, and I said minutes. <laughs> now I'm now I'm the cool guy. Now I'm the grandpa who to try try to talk slang to his grandchildren, right? But if I do this, then you see it hangs, and I go over here and I try to do this. You see that my thread hangs. So a denial of service. Who of you works on the cloud? That's a denial of pocket money, I would say. Or a denial of your bonus. Because, well, every time it hangs, it spins up another thread. It spins up another thread. It spins up another thread. So I will keep doing this. So you see, with a regular expression and the fact that JavaScript only can do one thing at a time, Stupid. <laughs> you might make you, you 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 might turn out to be a problem, right? Next thing. I'm going go going on and on and on. I like to mock on, 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 on JavaScript, but make sure I will do Java as well. I have some Java examples, so don't be worried. Um well let's do a Java example. Maybe that's even more fun. Because it will, or, or, or we will be known like, yeah, that guy who only can bash your JavaScript. No, no. Okay, let's do a more, more advanced example. Advanced. Say, for instance, we go to this application. This application is a Spring application, and what it does, if I see, look at this application. It instantiates some items, and every item contains a name. And the price, so beans for 50 cents, milk for, for, for 109, and beer for what? Beer for 5.99, what kind of beer is that, dude? Probably this thing was written in London, and it's before Brexit, because after Brexit, well, everything will drop. We don't know, up or down. But so if we look at the item, what I said, it's an ID, it's a name, it's a cost, and it's just general spring boot. What is interesting is this part. Because what we do here is we use the Spring Data Library. And by extending the CRUD repo, we have CRUD stuff at our disposal by just interfacing, by just naming conventions. So find by name, this is just an interface. I do not have to create the implementation. It does it for me. So I can do something like... Find by oh, by name and cost, which is perfectly fine, and I will paste in the name as a parameter and eventually the cost as a parameter, and it will create the repo functionality for me. What's even more fun is this annotation above. Can everybody read this? Repository REST resource. By using this annotation and of course implementing or, or uh, de depending on that Spring Boot uh, stuff, what it does, it creates a REST repo for you just by that. You don't have to do anything but your CRUD repo will be available as REST endpoint. Which again is pretty cool because now I do not have to take care of that. I can, I can look at my business value instead of my boilerplate. So let's run this stuff. Demo gods. Yes. So if we go over here, I go to port 8080 and I have the hell browser, which is again a package that you can use and it's just to, for demo purposes now. What we can do over here if I just Where's my mouse? Over here. If I just do items and I say go, then you will see I have all the items over here I just instantiated. Beans, milk, whatever. I can do a slash search, say find by name, and my name is milk. Oh, then I have to do, right? And I say go, 
then I will have milk and nothing else. The new one I just, I just showed you, say I do uh, name and cost, it works, but say I do 1.3, then we will not have any results. Cool, so my REST repository works. Let's continue because, well, we're building new stuff, not old stuff. Well, there is a kind of problem over here because you see over here what we can do? Custom request headers. That's fun. Let's do something with that. This one is called Spring Break. Don't ever Google for Spring Break, by the way. Not the, not the American Spring Break, right? So say we go to this, uh, I don't know if you can read, you can read this, right? It's, yeah, I know it's common line. So what we do here, we can insert custom JSON. But what we also can do is by doing the right things, we can instantiate things over there. Because, well, hey, it's open. It's there for us to use. And even if we do not use these custom headers, by doing this, and what it does is we use the string utils, stream utils, we copy something, and it's actually calling the runtime with a command. We wire that to an input stream. Again, we, can't, we get that back, we get that response, get that to an output stream, and point it out. So what we basically do, we just insert a malicious header. And you will say, wow, that's far-fetched. No. If there is, there, there is some script kitty somewhere in the world who just does this for a living, tries it out, and publishes this. And when this is published, then you're, then you're basically screwed. Because what can we do? Say, for instance, we do this. And I will just copy paste it and I will get it. This it is a curl command. And by doing this, oh, that was too fast. Again, just let me clear it up. This curl command, it does the contact type JSON. Then that malicious header, what I just showed you, and that insert that malicious header by doing something. In this case, uh, where is the, here. We call the environment variables. So we did that, the malicious header I just showed you, we called that, the, we called the string utils that called the, um, the command line, and now we're doing the environment variables. By doing that, and posting that, over here, I will see, I will have the variables, environment variables of my system. And again, I can do every sort of Linux command on that point. I could do an LS, I can do whatever. I can even make sure if I'm in there that I just blindly replace the LS or dir or whatever command with something else. So, uh, that, that, yeah, but if you, if you give me the time for that, I can do that. So backtracking and reading your logs will be impossible. So giving people enough time, what they did with the struts problem, can happen over here as well. And this is not even used in this system because we simply only use the, um, the normal repository. But if you see what I did over here, I used an endpoint, localhost 8080 items one, which just give me the first item that is there. And if I just use it without that malicious header, it will give me the first item. So by not using it doesn't mean you're not exploitable. Spring Boot does magic with reflection and that kind of stuff. And by just inserting it, you might be vulnerable even if you do not use it, know it, execute it right away. So be careful. Let me do another, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, 7.30, 15 minutes kind of. Well, let me do another one. It's a Java one again. But let me, let me quit this one. I have another one, another example for you. And this one is called ZipSlip. And let me just show you. 
if I run the right demo application, yes, thank you. Again, demo gods, bear with me. Drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. Yes, cool. All right, let's go to, it's, it's again a very beautiful, beautiful application. Very useful, you don't want to do anything with it. But I'm going straight away to the part that you, that you want to know. I mean, for instance, again, we have an awesome about page. Oh, this one is already, <laughs> it's already hacked. No, I have to rebuild it. That was actually the outcome of it, but I spoiled it. Boo-hoo. Let me just terminate it, and I will show you from the beginning. Yes, run it again. All right. So we're over here. The About page is again, oh, this may, might be browser catch, yeah. All right, so the About page, nothing, nothing serious, but what we can do, we can upload files over here. And what it does, it can upload a file, and if it's a zip file, it unzips. Pretty cool, but let's, let's make a malicious zip file. Right? Let's create it. Just, just create one over here. Help me out. I will go into my... Can you all read this? So we're going to create a zip file. It's now called evil.zip. Let me call it technician evil because, well, that sounds more interesting. We insert a zip entry, which is a good.txt with some body. And what we do over here is we create a new file, and what we do in this file, we try to do a path reversal. So dot dot slash dot dot slash slash target class statics, and we try to override the, the about page. Okay, I have to know where the about page is, of course, but well, hey, come on. If you know that, that's easy. And we simply, I can simply do the same, for instance, for, on, on, on uh, Heroku Cloud and try that, and then I know exactly where, where some instances of the JDK are, are, and I can override them, but it's funny to do it over here. So say, for instance, what kind of, uh, what kind of buddy should I do in? Like, ha, 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 ha. You are mine. Mm, nah, no. Let, 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 me keep, let, let, me keep, let me keep it to that. Yes? Well, let's, um, let's run this test thing. And let me see if it creates a zip file for me. Uh, okay, it creates a zip file. Let me, let me just show you that in the terminal. That's the other terminal. Cool. So we see that the tag nation uh, is one on the top, right? So if I do the info on that zip file, what do you see that, that it has two entries? One just normal entry, as you would expect, and one entry that has a path reversal. So go, it goes out, outside of the scope, and then it tries to put something somewhere else where I don't like it. Let's try that. So by choosing this technation evil zip file, I open it and I submit. And what we see is that now in the path I normally put the stuff, we see that the good.txt is there. If we go to the about page, I just overridden it. But so, what does, it mean, does, does this mean? With this vulnerability, we can override any arbitrary file if we know where it is. Exactly. But how many, of course, as long as you're in the right scope. If, if you're not in root rights, you cannot go to, to that. Point taken. But how many people just do something like, it works, let's ship it. That's another question, how many Docker containers run as root? So yes, you are true, and, but that's, that's what, why you need to collaborate with people from infrastructure and from, from security because they might have a point in some place. Like, no, this will never happen. And what the thing is, is in this case, we used a um, vulnerable unzip library. And a un vulnerable unzip library, well, like many, we, we do not have a standard unzip library for Java which for instance for Python, and I think for NPM, is, there is, it's just, it's just a util, and it's safe. But we do have the things to unzip, and what most of these libraries do is they do not look at the input path. 
and blindly paste the input path over there and put the file over there without recognizing if it does any path reversal or, the, or if it goes out of the scope of that program. By doing so, if you, if you would do that, you would never have this problem because, well, then I just put you in a sandbox and you can basically only deploy files over there. So that came to, comes to the conclusion that, well, that hacking is also fun. But what is the solution of this, this stuff? Well, the solution is not, it's, it consists of three things. Culture, process, and tooling. And all three are equally important because, first of all, the team culture is important. Because we have different people. I mean, with different people, with different insights, with different de things they care about. Developers want to create new things, put this into production as fast as possible, and just want to create new, funny, cool, shiny stuff. Security people do not care about your cool stuff. They just care about the fact that you will not be breached. That's the only care. If it doesn't work, it's cool, because then you will not be breached. The ops people, they just care if it's easy maintainable. If it doesn't work, it doesn't go produ to production, I don't care, because I do not have to maintain it. Early weekend. And then management, well, they care about money. So you mean to get this straight inside the team culture and see from a developer's point of view that security is important, and from a security point of view that developers are important as well, and not just say, no, then we might find a solution to it. But this is the hardest one. And then you have to adapt your process. And adapting a process is hard because nobody wants to change. Nobody. Maybe people say they want to change, but they don't. Because, well, you might change for a day, two days, three days, and in the end, you will go back to your old routine. So the best way to implement it is to see if it can be implemented in your current process. If, the, if there's tooling available, that can help you during your current process. Not that you have to do so many extra manual work or so many extra stuff to do so because, well, that will last for two days. But if it's not intrusive in your current process, you might have more chance of success. And then, of course, there is the tooling. You need the right tooling. Tooling can help you. Tooling can automate things, and tooling, if the tooling is applied correct, can be helpful. I mean, who has security scanning tools in place now? How many of this, uh, of this security scanning is only done by your CI pipeline? Most of you. Who does this on your, on your local machine? One. Cool. You're my friend for today. No, but seriously. For instance, I'm going to show you tooling of our company just to show you what tooling is about. I don't care if you use it or not but you should use it in many places. For instance, on your local machine, if I go to my terminal back again, and I was in this zip slip kind of thing, right? By installing, I installed the SNCC CLI, and by doing a SNCC test, it will, hopefully, it will analyze my pump dependencies, it will query the vulnerability database, and it will give me an output on the job over here if my internet would be, would be working. Yes, please. Yes, it does work, cool. And what you see over here is that I have a couple of vulnerabilities in here, including this zip thing I just called. And by giving you directly the advice from going from 112 to 113, it's like, okay, just, just alter my pom file and we're done. So by doing this, I am safe from the beginning. So that means that my security team will not find a breach over there. That means less rework for me and again, early weekend. Again, by doing this, you can, for instance, do this in your, well, say you use a plugin for your uh, IntelliJ stuff, if you use IntelliJ. And you see that over here, I also have the problem written over here that I have a vulnerability. It scans my Maven tree. By fixing it directly in my IDE, I can solve this. So that's from the developer point of view. But you also can do, is just make sure that your repo is scanned. This is an NPM repo, and I just, this is a Git repo simply, I hang it into my, my, my uh, in this case, um, my SNCC UI, and it will scan my repo for me. It will scan every single pull request that comes in. 
it will even, if there is a new vulnerability, it can, it can create automatic uh, pull requests for me that I do not have to look at it. I just have to look, okay, is this good enough? Yes, it's good, go. It scans on forehand if it doesn't, if, if it doesn't uh, bring in new vulnerabilities, and I can do it with just a few easy clicks. But, again, all these things look awesome, and all these things can be helpful, because we scan not only your dependencies, but we look at the transitive dependencies and see if there's a problem over there and what you have to do on top level. So it might work by increasing one minor version. If it might break your things, we might tell you as well. But again, the tooling is important, so you have to make sure that this tooling is in place in your current process. So that might not only work with hanging it into your CI system, but also from a different point of, point of view, from your developer point of view, from your repo point of view, from your pull fix uh, point of view, and by doing an instance, what, if I do SNCC monitor over here on my, on my local system, it will take a snapshot of that dependency tree and it will keep scanning this dependency tree, for instance, if I go to production. And I can hang that to my CMSCI as well. So okay, it takes a snapshot, it keeps scanning, if there are new vulnerabilities, it will ping me automatically. So no further hassle, which is good because I just want to, want to create new stuff. So, in the end, what we are trying to do is we need to shift security left. Security is not only important as a gatekeeper. You have to use it as a gatekeeper, of course. I think we all agree that we do not want to be vulnerable and that our client data will be out in the open because, well, that's not only bad for us, for our company, but maybe also reflect on us as a person. But if I can do this as early as possible in the chain by not bringing in new vulnerabilities, that will be, would, would save half of the time. If I can do that again by scanning my repo because, well, the point that I put it into my repo, at that point it may be not be vulnerable, but it can be that our new vulnerability is disclosed two days from now. So we keep scanning from that point. If we, if we build it before we go to production, we can use it as a gatekeeper, but also give back stuff that we can easily fix it, because only saying, no, you're wrong, doesn't help me. I'm like, yeah, tell me what's wrong. So again, process, team culture, and tooling. Make sure you choose the right tooling to integrate in your current process and that you have the same vision with your team. That means from all points of view, play along. My name is Brian. I work for Sneak. I don't know how, many time I have, well, how much time I have left. I don't think that much. Five minutes, right? Four or five minutes. So if there are any questions, come up here. I have a lot of hack demos as well, but I would just want to keep it short because, well, Beer. So, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Once my project is in production, we can do. Uh, okay, this again. I can talk over about my tooling. This is not a product pitch, but I can talk about my tooling. What we do? We take a snapshot of that dependency tree, and we scan that dependency tree on a daily basis, or on an hourly basis, whatever you want. And by on a daily basis, I get if there is a new vulnerability found, we, uh, e we email you or we, Slack, we give a Slack alert or we integrate with your Jira, whatever you like, and maybe even uh, create a new pull request if your Git repo is connected to it. So by taking that snapshot that's in production, we can keep scanning it until you have a new, uh, new, go a new thing that goes into production, take a snapshot from that and keep scanning that. We do not, th this tooling that I showed you doesn't... Um, do static code analysis on your code, only on the dependency to, uh, on your on your dependencies, because there are a lot of cool static analysis tools al already in the market, and we say that we cannot know if it's vulnerable or not if we do not have the right context. Plus, we do not want to look into your code. Simply, I think that some government agencies and some banking people would agree with me. Any other questions? Yes, sir. By specification, uh, it is explicitly allowed that relative paths are uh, OK 
about, about the zip vulner vulnerability, you mean. So the, the, the question is, if it's, is it really a vulnerability if it is allowed by specification? Explicitly. explicitly. If, if it's explicitly allowed by specification. Well, first of all, it wasn't explicitly allowed by specification in this case for this library. And you can say it's not a vulnerability because and it, if, if you look it up, it's a medium vulnerability. So it depends if you know and you know what you do. Hey, it's up to you. We just warn you that this might happen. So you can say, and that, that's also, you, the tooling must be available, whatever tooling you use, that you can say, I will ignore this because that this doesn't apply to us. But um, yeah, you can argue about that, but I would say, yes, it's a vulnerability, but because nobody wants to, want, wants to get the freedom to go out of the scope of that zip file and put it some arbitrary, uh, arbitrary point, and then, of course, you need to make sure that your uh, web server isn't running on root. So it's always the problems is just not just one, most of the time it's not one vulnerability, but a couple of vulnerabilities. But just wanted to show you by just real, with real libraries, with real examples, if you do not upgrade, you might be vulnerable. If there are no very further questions, I want to thank you for, it, for your attention. I hope you had a great day. And if you have any questions like later on, please feel free to ping me on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs>